All right, Lauren, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to speak with everyone about coping with stress in these times of uncertainty. I also wanna commend the generator staff for putting together the emergency response program to provide um, those with businesses with a number of support in a variety of areas, including mental health. I know that for all of you here um, in attendance, we're all dealing with unique stressors and with changes brought about by the coronavirus. I'm sure that this has affected not just the way that you operate in terms of your business, but how you go about your daily lives. And some of you have probably had to make some really difficult decisions over the past few days or weeks, or will need to make really good um, difficult decisions about your business. And I know that the stress of doing so while worrying about the health and safety of your families is enough to make your worries spiral out of control. And so the goal for today's presentation is to have you leave here knowing that it's completely normal to be emotionally affected by everything that's going on right now. But I also want you to leave here knowing that there's simple strategies that you can use to manage your worries and your stress. And just a quick disclaimer here, the information provided here is just meant for informational purposes and in no way is meant to diagnose or treat any kind of mental health conditions. All right, so with that being said, um, to give you a brief overview of what we're gonna talk about today, um, I wanna start out by getting everyone clear about what it means to be worried and stressed, right? What do these, thing, what do these things actually look like? And the reason for this is so that you'll be best able to apply the strategies that we'll be discussing and so that you won't look like the cater here trying to fake it till you make it. All right, and as Lauren mentioned, um, feel free to put any of your questions in the Q&A box. And again, I'll be asking questions throughout just to get you involved. I wanna hear from you what you're experiencing. And another thing before we jump in is that I'm living in a city. I apologize in advance if you hear any city noises, sirens, uh, my window's closed, but just in case those noises um, leak into here, just apologies in advance. All right, so I want to start us off here with this quote, worrying doesn't take away tomorrow's troubles, it takes away today's peace. And so my first question for you is, how many times today did you find yourself worrying? You just go in and put an answer into the chat box. How many times did you find yourself worrying? Right? For some of you, it may be just once. For some of you, it feels like you're in a constant state of worry. All right? I see here maybe like three to four times. All right? And so someone only once today, right? There's going to be a variety in terms of how often you find yourself worrying. Right? And for some people, these concerns may be related to you know, their own health or the health of their loved ones, changes to daily routines, financial stressors, making difficult decisions, um, and also things, you know, simple um, as wondering what you're going to do next, right? In addition to worrying about getting the necessities, right? Groceries, medical items that you may need while practicing social distancing, worrying about isolation and loved ones, you know, difficulties with sleeping, eating, concentrating, and so a number of things. And so what does it actually mean to worry, right? We all have a general sense of what worrying looks or feels like, but if we were to define it, we can say that worrying is a way of thinking ahead that focuses on negative, uncertain outcomes or things that can go wrong. And the thing about worrying is that it tends to be repetitive. So it's something that you find yourself doing over and over, right? So for example, What I have here is called a worry chain, right? And so when we start to worry, it may begin with a simple thought, right? Maybe the realization that you have a headache. And from that thought leads to another thought, uh-oh, is this the coronavirus? And then that then leads to, wait, did I pass it on to someone at work? Did I pass it on to someone when I was out at the grocery store? Oh my goodness, what if I pass this on to someone and they pass it on to someone else and then everyone becomes infected? And then next thing I know, I'm losing everyone that I love, right? And so from having a simple thought and realization that you have a headache, this then leads to you imagining losing everyone that you know and that you love, right? 
And so how many of you have found yourself having similar thoughts? Perhaps it's not related to any physical symptoms, but it could be related to your businesses, right? So for instance, it could be that it starts off with, you know what, I may have to think about making decisions in terms of who can remain employed, right? Or maybe it's decisions about your business having to close down, and then that then leads to you being poor and destitute for the rest of your life, right? And so given the times that we're facing, one thing, again, I want to emphasize is that it's normal if you found yourself getting into a worry chain, right? If you found yourself thinking about the worst case scenarios and thinking about all the possible outcomes. And so I can relate to this certainly in terms of this example, right? Every time I feel like my nose is getting stuffy, even if it's something completely unrelated, I start thinking, is this you, Rona? Is this the coronavirus, right? And so again, what I'm trying to say here is that these experiences, these worries are a normal reaction to what's going on around us. And so when we tend to worry, right? We tend to worry when situations are open to different interpretations, and so they're ambiguous. We may also worry when we're facing a new situation, right? And so we don't have the experience um, to rely on, right? It's not like it's something that's happened before, so we know what to do and what not to do. Another type of situation um, that leads us to worry is when something is unpredictable, right? We're not sure at all how things are gonna turn out. And so when we think about worrying, there are two types of worrying, right? And so there are worries that can be helpful. And so this kind of worrying deals with actual problems that you are facing right now. So for example, and it, um, that could mean, you know, the thought here, my children are off school and I need help looking after them, right? So the concern here is child care. Another example of um, a helpful real problem kind of worry is I don't have enough food in the house to last more than a few days, right? And so again, this is what we call real problem worries. You're dealing with things that are affecting you right now in the present moment. Another type of worrying that people tend to engaging, especially in times of uncertainty, is what we refer to as unhelpful hypothetical worries, right? So these don't deal with things that are actually occurring right now, but more about things that are gonna happen or could happen in the future, right? And so what does this look like? It looks like, you know, what if I lose my job and end up destitute? I'm young and healthy, but what if I end up on a ventilator? Right? And so in this moment, the person having this thought shows no symptoms, no, nothing's wrong with them, but they're moving into the future and they're thinking about what can potentially happen. And when we engage in hypothetical worries, usually we're not imagining pretty great outcomes. We're not worrying that, oh my gosh, I'm going to be you know, so successful and so healthy that I won't know what to do with myself. Nope. That's not where these worries tend to go. Right? They tend to think about the worst case scenario right? They tend to think, focus on what's the worst possible outcome, not just for me, but perhaps for other people as well. And so the thing about worrying is it creates a sense of certainty, especially in times of uncertainty. And let's think about this, right? So if you're planning ahead and you're thinking about all the things that can go wrong, there's a sense of control there. Right, because if one of these things even occurs, you feel prepared because you've already thought about it. Right, and so a question to you guys given the situation that you've been in, do you find yourselves engaging in more real world problem worries or hypothetical worries? And just go ahead and you can um, type in which one it tends to be. So, do you find yourself worrying more about actual problems, or do you find yourself focusing primarily on things that are occurring in the future? All right, I see some people mention both, right, real, All right, both. Yeah, there seems to be a mix, but yep, I see both, both, both. All right, someone mentioned that the hypothetical tends to creep in, All right? And again, given the situation that we're in, 
it's normal to have both helpful, right, real world worries and hypothetical worries, right? And so now I want to move on to what the distinction is, right? When is worrying actually a problem? All right? Is this something that you've thought about? Like, is it actually helpful to worry? I never thought about it that way, right? And so the thing is that worrying can actually be helpful um, in terms of getting you what you want, right? It can move you to problem solve about the issues that you're having in your life, right? And so a good way to think about this is that if you're worrying about a presentation, you know, to a client, if you're worrying about, you know, a customer, relations, whatever it is, right? If that worrying leads you to problem solve and to address what the issue or challenge is, then that's a helpful kind of worrying, right? What we refer to as normal worrying. But when worrying becomes problematic is when it focuses so much on hypothetical situations or you're worrying so much that it doesn't lead you to problem solve, but it leaves you feeling demoralized, upset, exhausted, and stuck, right? You're just playing this, these thoughts over and over in your head. They're spiraling out of control, right? You find yourself in this worry chain where it just keeps going over and over. And so it's then interfering with you being able to live the life that you want to lead, all right? So again, worrying has its benefits. It can help you to problem solve, but when it becomes too much or too repetitive and makes you feel stuck, that's when it's problematic. And so now that we've established that worrying is a way of thinking that can either be helpful or unhelpful, I wanted to switch gears a bit for us to focus now on stress, right? Similar to worrying, we've all been stressed before. We've used that term over and over. And when we think about the definition, stress is simply your body's response to an external event or demand. So for instance, having a deadline, right? And stress, like worrying, is also normal, right? It can be acute, meaning that it's short-lived, meaning that there's a challenge right there, and then once it's resolved, the stress goes away. Or stress can also be chronic, right? For instance, it can be caused by ongoing financial problems, right? And it's something that you constantly feel. And so again, having stress and worry are normal, right? And so what are some causes of stress, right? I want you guys to share, what are some of the things that are causing you stress right now? All right, we have someone mentioning money, paycheck protection program applications, people are concerned about job security, right? Potential job loss, worrying about the health of family and friends, filing for bankruptcy, right? Another thing mentioned here I see is trying to find balance between work, between caring for your family, homeschooling your children, um, feeling helpless, right? The health of your business. And so there are a lot of things that are consuming your thoughts right now and things that are causing you stress. And of course, isn't an extensive list, but some of you tapped into some of these causes, right? And so essentially, stress can stem from relationships with others. It can stem from work-related issues, worrying about your finances, worrying about the health, safety of your loved ones, and also dealing with drastic changes, right? Related to marriage, related to relationships, related to um, your companies, your jobs, your employees, your own job security, and so again, a lot of things can cause stress, All right? And so another challenge could be having to work from home, right? Having to deal with unexpected changes that have arisen as a result of the circumstances that we're in. And so while we've all experienced stress before, it's really important to know when you are stressed and what that looks like. And so if you have a hard time knowing when you're stressed, when you're stressed, it's going to take a longer time for you to address it, right? And so when we think about the symptoms of stress, they can fall into three categories, right? And so there could be physical symptoms or signs of stress, emotional mental health signs of stress, as well as behavioral signs of stress. And so when we look at the physical symptoms, these can include things such as headaches, having problems sleeping, feeling like your stomach is in knots or you always have an upset stomach. It can result in changes in your weight, feeling that tension in your face, your back, your shoulders, 
And when we move on to thinking about the emotional side of stress, right? We can think about this in terms of changes that we experience in our mood, feeling an increase in our anxiety, feeling an increase in you know, our worries, having trouble concentrating or making decisions, feeling extremely overwhelmed, and perhaps even a loss of motivation, right? In terms of the behavioral signs of stress, this can include things like changes in our appetites. So we find ourselves eating more or perhaps even eating less, right? We may find ourselves turning to things that can help us cope and increasing um, unhelpful behaviors such as smoking and drinking. And some people may even turn to some retail therapy, right? Where they find themselves on Amazon or they're compulsively shopping as a way to cope with the distress that they have around them. And so when you think about how you experience stress, right? What do you tend to notice that lets you know, oh my goodness, I'm really stressed and freaking out. Is it the physical symptoms? Is it the mental health symptom or is it the behavioral symptom? Type in the chat and let me know which of these categories you notice first that lets you know that you're feeling really stressed. All right, so I'm seeing a lot of physical here. Mm -hmm. Physical, some emotional as well. Someone said sleep, what sleep? <laughs> All right. All right, I've seen a lot of issues with sleeping, emotional and behavioral. And the whole point here is to recognize that the way that we experience stress can be different, right? We may experience, you know, symptoms from all three of these categories, but what we actually notice may be just one, right? So a lot of you may be more in tune with your physical symptoms of stress. Right. For others, you may notice that your worry is increasing or it can be a lack of sleep. And for some of you, mm, you don't even really notice, right? It's not until someone points it out, you know, perhaps your mood has been more irritable or you, you know, they find that you're not being able to focus or concentrate. Then that's when you realize like, oh, wait, something's up. Like, oh, wow, I've been extremely stressed these past few days and these past few weeks. And so, do you think feeling stressed can be helpful? Yes or no? Is having stress in your life good? Seen a whole lot of yeses. Yep. At times, yep. All right. Excellent. So, at times, for sure. Right? So, we know that stress can be helpful in that it can prepare our bodies to face a threat, right? Or to flee to safety, right? And so when we're stressed, our heart rate increases, our pulse quickens, right? Our muscles become tense, we breathe more quickly. And this is all to prepare us to deal with the stress that is in front of us, right? And so in life-threatening situations, i.e. not being chased by a bear, not having to deal with spiders, um, whatever that situation is, right? If you're dealing with a non-threatening situation, then stress can motivate you. For instance, if you have a deadline, if you have a pitch to prepare, you know, if, you, if there's something that you need to get done, that stress can be motivating, right? And so in some instances, stress can facilitate high performance, especially when we perceive this threat as a challenge. The problem that occurs though, is that when stress becomes too much, right? When we're dealing with multiple demands or these demands are clustered together or these demands are extremely severe, right? This can lead to your resources being overwhelmed and can also lead to a deterioration in your performance, right? Mm -hmm. And so for these reasons, it's important for you to manage stress, right? It, and it, one thing I didn't mention is that it can also result in um, harm to your health over the long term, and this may manifest itself in terms of conditions such as heart disease, experiencing increases in your blood pressure, um, as well as mental illnesses such as depression and anxiety disorders. And so for this reason, it's really important for us to manage stress, right? Recognizing that in some instances, it can be beneficial in that it can prompt us to perform highly, to meet the demand, and to rise to the challenge, right? It's when things become too overwhelming, and the stress isn't managed, that it can start to have negative effects. 
And so one thing that I want you to leave with when we think about stress is first that everyone experiences and reacts to stress differently, right? And because of this, it's really important that we not make assumptions or compare ourselves to others, right? And so we may see a coworker or a family member that we're video chatting with and you feel like your whole life is falling apart and this person seems calm and collected, right? What do you start to do? You start to think about, well, wait a minute, am I overreacting? Is it me? Am I just blowing things out of proportion because the person I'm talking to seems really calm about all this? Or we can make the assumption that, you know what, everything is falling apart and this person doesn't seem to care. Why? Because they're not reacting like how I'm reacting, right? And so we make the wrong assumptions just because how people are reacting and how they're experiencing it does not look like how we expect and think they should. And so what can we do, right? What can you do? We spent a bit of time going over what it means to worry, what it means to be stressed, recognizing that both of these things can be helpful, but if they get out of control, that's when they can have detrimental effects. And so the first thing that you can do is to start by thinking about whether the problem and situation you're dealing with is something that can be changed. And so I wanted to start by introducing you to this concept of problem versus emotion-focused coping, right? When we have a problem, it's important for us to ask ourselves, is this something that I can change? And if yes, is now a good time to work on it? If that answer is yes, then you'll proceed with problem-focused coping, which I'll get into in a little bit. However, if this is something that you can't change, right, you don't switch to problem solving. What you need to do is focus more on emotion-focused coping, right? And the challenge that we may find ourselves in is that the problem that we're dealing with, there may be aspects to it that we can change. And there are also maybe aspects that we can't change. Right? And so when to use problem-focused coping and when to use emotion-focused coping will be a bit more clear as I go into what these strategies actually look like. And so when we think about emotion-focused coping, right, this involves trying to reduce the negative emotional responses that are associated with stress. Right? And when we use emotion-focused coping is when we're dealing with a situation that is outside our control. We have a problem that we can't actually exert any change upon, right? And so what does this look like? Healthy emotion-focused coping involves things like distraction, so focusing on pleasurable activities, right? Things that can help to boost your mood, to relieve your stress, to help you to think more clearly about how you're gonna approach the problem. It can also involve things such as talking or writing about the negative events that led to those unpleasant emotions and you feeling stressed. Right? This could mean um, writing a journal, it could mean talking to someone, you know, just having them listen, where you're able to share your concerns and the things that you're experiencing. It could also include things such as turning to um, meditation or, you know, turning to spirituality or religion. And another important thing that people often fail to do when they're dealing with a situation that they can't control is that they fail to change the way that they view the situation. Right. And so instead of feeling as if you're trapped at home, think about what being at home might allow you to do that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. Right. Now, what unhealthy coping looks like, it's engaging in behaviors that can potentially worsen your situation or impair your ability to actually handle the circumstances. Right. And so this can include things like turning to your favorite comfort food right? Instead of stocking up on the essentials, you find yourself dealing with, you know, buying a lot of ice cream, taking comfort instead of dealing with your emotions, you're eating them. It can also include things like drinking more alcohol, using drugs. And one thing that people often do is that they suppress their emotions, right? They're feeling really frustrated because they can't change something or they've had to make a really difficult decision and they're feeling a sense of guilt from that. And so, they may tell themselves like, I shouldn't be feeling this way, right? Someone else has it worse than I do. I shouldn't be feeling this way because, you know, I'm really strong and I should be able to cope with this. And so we may be telling ourselves a number of things, 
um, to suppress those emotions. And the problem with this is that when we suppress our emotions, they're going to flare up at one point or another. And I like to think about this by using um, the illustration of a beach ball. If we're trying to keep a beach ball underwater, eventually what's going to happen is that it's going to pop up, right? And when that happens, people are going to be looking at you like you're crazy, like, whoa, where did this come from, right? Because you're trying to suppress how you're feeling. On the other hand, um, problem-focused coping is something that you do when there is a situation that you can change. And so, for instance, this looks like problem-solving, right? Using the different problem-solving steps by first being able to clearly identify what the problem is. If you don't have a clear sense of the problem, it's going to be really hard for you to implement any problem-solving strategies. Another issue, um, or I'm sorry, another thing that you can do is use time management strategies, right? How are you spending your time? Are you spending your time thinking about things that you can't change or are you spending your time focusing on things that you can change, right? Do you need to get organized in order for you to effectively solve this problem or do you need to ask for help, right? And so again, problem-focused coping is all about taking action. Now, a quick way to summarize this, um, in terms of problem focus versus emotion focused coping is that problem focused coping again focuses on what you can do emotion focused coping is more about thinking about how you can deal with the situation right and again these can include pleasurable things it can include asking for emotional support whereas problem focused coping it's on getting instrumental support and what we mean by that is that if you need help getting your car fixed right you're not going to talk to someone about the feelings about having to get your car fixed, you're gonna go into problem solving mode by either getting it fixed or asking someone to fix it for you. Now the challenge that people often run into that keeps them stuck or maintains their stress is that there's a mismatch between the problem that they're dealing with and the type of solution that they're applying. And so we have a lot of people who are applying problem focused coping strategies to things that they can't actually change right and uh, vice versa we have people who are engaging in emotion focused coping when the situation allows them to actually do something about it and so when we think about that one thing to be mindful of is not just what you can change but am i applying the appropriate strategies when it comes to our worrying another thing that's often helpful is to set aside worrying time Right? Some of you may never have heard of this concept before, but essentially what it means is to give yourself a worry budget right? by first deciding when you're going to worry and for how long. And this is especially if you find that your worries are intrusive and they tend to pop up throughout the day or you spend a lot of energy focusing on perhaps those hypothetical situations. Right? And so what does this actually look like? It can mean starting off with 15 minutes a day and setting aside a specific time to worry. Right? And so let's say you start worrying right now, but your scheduled worry time is at 5.30, you're gonna postpone that worry. And it's important to, to make sure that you're not worrying or making that worry time before bedtime, because that's what a lot of people do, right? It's the end of the day, they're recounting all the events, what went right, what went wrong, what needs to be done, what they didn't get to, what they need to get to tomorrow, and that can start that worry chain going, right? So it's really important that you set aside worry time that's not close to your bedtime. Now, when you notice yourself worrying about something, this can either be an opportunity um, to come up with a next step or to take action, right? And so if you're worrying about something and, you know, let's say it's focused on your finances or focusing on figuring out what to do about, you know, the employees that you're working with, if that starts to happen, come up with something to do that you can take action for, right? Or another strategy is to get back to postponing it to your worry time. What this essentially does is that it contains the amount of time that you're worrying. And if we think back to the previous slide, where it shows that when worrying becomes unhelpful is when it impairs our ability to problem solve and to lead the life that we want to, by setting aside this worry time, right? We're able to focus more on things that are important to us and things that are going to enable us to meet our goals. Another thing that's often helpful is to have you um, write down your worries, right? Spend about eight to 10 minutes 
writing down um, what are the obsessive thoughts that you're having? What are these worrying thoughts? What are you concerned about? Um, and we've, you know, research has shown that doing this can help to calm or reduce those worrisome thoughts. In terms of stress management strategies, um, it's important to examine your priorities, right? Are you spending too much time focusing on things that are not important? Or are you really honing in on what is it, it that's essential and what it is that you can do, right? A lot of times when people are faced with extreme stress, oh, as a way to cope, they focus on all the little things that make them feel productive but aren't actually helpful or important in that moment, right? And so to get around this, it's important to, or helpful to make a to-do list and decide what it is that you can actually address, right? Another thing may be learning how to say no. One other... Um, means of managing stress is to check your expectations, right? Do you have unrealistic expectations about how much you can and should be able to do right now, right? Are you thinking that there's so much more that you should be able to address, right? There's so much more that you should be able to do for your own business, for your own employees, and failing to recognize that given the circumstances that we're in, you're going to be limited to a certain effect. And so it's important to be satisfied with doing your best, acknowledging that, and being flexible and accepting change, right? If we're still gonna operate as if none of this is going on, then that's gonna impair our ability to adapt effectively, right? And another thing too, especially with entrepreneurs, is to watch out for perfectionism, right? Making sure that everything needs to be done perfectly, exactly how you envisioned it, and perhaps that has led to your success in other areas, but when we're dealing with uncertainty or situations that we don't have full control of, aiming for perfectionism is gonna be undermining. Now this seems really simple and you're like, stress management, breathe, what? But the reason this is here is that essentially when we're taking deep breaths, it sends a signal to our brain saying, guess what brain, I'm actually calm. And as a result, that can lead to improvements in your concentration, right? What you don't wanna be doing is making very important decisions when you're extremely stressed, right? We know that stress can be good in some aspects, but when you're overwhelmed and you're trying to make very important decisions, that's gonna impair your judgment and can lead to you making decisions that can be very detrimental, right? And so breathing is easy, you can do it at any time. And just by taking a few slow deep breaths, that can help to relieve that stress response where our heart rates increase, where we, our breathing increases, our blood pressure increases, right? Because again, when we're stressed, it's our body enabling us to prepare for a threat or to flee a situation. When we introduce that deep breathing, what it does is it says, you know what, I'm not being threatened. And that stress response becomes diminished and again, allows you to be able to improve your concentration and to focus better. All right, some other strategies include being active, taking breaks, and also maintaining structure. And the reason I kind of put all these together is that they all focus on self-care. Right. And so being active doesn't mean that you need to go run a marathon or you need to get, you know, you need to get out there and walk for 30 minutes. Just remember that something is better than nothing. Right. It can be as simple as stretching, doing some yoga poses, but doing something to be active. Right. And we know that research has shown consistently that activity, physical activity is something that's very effective in terms of relieving stress. It's also important to take a break right? Even if it's a five minute or a 10 minute break, this can help to shift, create a shift um, that can result in a common effect and can improve your energy and your focus. And when you're taking a break, don't take a break and do something that you don't want to do or you're not going to enjoy, right? Like that's going to defeat the purpose of taking a break. And so make sure that it's something that it's either fun or that's going to bring you pleasure. And when it comes to structure, you know, with people having to work at home or to shift the way that they're working, it's important to introduce that structure because it'll provide some sense of normalcy and create a sense of like, you know what, maybe I can't control everything else, but I can control this situation here in terms of when and where I'm able to work and when I'm able to connect to others. Now, I know that some of you or most of you perhaps, you know, have employees that you're dealing with. You're considering, you know, um, next steps in terms of where your business is going, how to deal with the questions that are being asked, how to deal with the anxiety 
the sense of over, um, feeling overwhelmed that's coming you know, from people that you work with or people that you work for, right? And so what I have here are a list of things to help leaders in particular maximize trust and minimize stress, right? First things first, you need to take care of your own emotional needs, right? We know that teams tend to mirror the behavior of their managers and bosses. And so if your approach is frantic, right? It's just laden with anxiety. Everyone can sense your worry from 10 miles away. Then that's going to seep into your workforce as well. And again, if we think about our ability to, you know, make decisions and to think clearly when we're really stressed out, then the decisions that we're making for our business can also be impacted as well. Some other ways to help uh, maximize trust and minimize stress for your employees is to communicate openly and honestly, right? There may be a tendency to focus on only the positives or to avoid having these really difficult conversations, right? But what this does is that, before I mention that, is that people can sense when you're uncertain, they can sense when you're hesitating and there's more to the story, but you're not telling them. And what this does is that this kind of ambiguity contributes to employee stress, right? And what do you think people are gonna do? If they feel like you're, you're being evasive or you're not fully disclosing, they're gonna fill in their gaps with their own assumptions. And these assumptions don't tend to be good. They tend to be very negative assumptions. And so it's really important to be transparent because this will help to reduce stress, minimize gossip, and in some instances can actually prevent a decline in people's work ethic. Right, because if people are making assumptions like everything is going to go to hell, it, you know, nothing's going to work out, then what's the point? Why should I continue working? Why should I continue focusing on my job? I should worry about something else, right? I may not even have a job. Um, another thing to consider, and this depends on the situation that you're in, is to give workers more autonomy and decision making authority, especially in times when there's a lot of uncertainty or things are being disrupted in terms of workflow. This can provide a sense of empowerment to employees because again, it expands the areas of things that they can exert some kind of control over. Another thing um, to consider is to help your employees um, see new work challenges as an opportunity to grow. We know that when some people are faced with a challenge um, and framing things as a challenge, this can improve motivation and performance as well. As I mentioned previously, it's important to be flexible, right? Acknowledge that there will be limits to working from home and how that may impact your employees' productivity, right? To carry over the same expectations that you had for your business and for your employees uh, before the coronavirus to now, right, is gonna set you up for a lot of disappointment. And another thing to remember is that there are gonna be limits to how much you're able to do and how much you're able to help, and that's okay, right? The important thing especially is to be mindful of being empathetic and providing the support where you can and helping to problem solve with your employees where you can, right? And so perhaps you have to cut back hours or you have to, you know, temporarily lay people off. At the same time, that doesn't mean that you could leave people out on their own there are also means for which you can provide support. And support doesn't just look like one thing. As we mentioned before, there's emotional support. There's also instrumental support, so something that you can actually do. There's informational support, so directing people to resources. All these things count as support, right? And where you can problem solve, again, problem solve. Now, in terms of having difficult conversations, right, with your employees or the people that you work with, one strategy that kind of brings all these techniques that I discussed together is to use the bridging the optimism gap technique, right? And to approach this, you don't start by just jumping right into solutions. The first step is to try to anticipate your team's concerns before meeting with them, right? Then when you have your team gathered, you wanna create a space and an opportunity for them to share how they're feeling, what their concerns are, and for you as a leader to acknowledge these challenges that your company, your organization, or your employees are facing. After that, it'll be important to introduce realistic op optimism, 
and the important word here is realistic. You don't want to make lofty promises, right? You don't want to try to comfort people by promising or saying things that aren't true or that you can't actually follow through on, right? So what does this look like? For example, you can start by talking about how things will remain the same, right? Or how you will be able to help, how you will be able to provide support. And then once you're, you spend some time allowing people to share their concerns, acknowledging those concerns, not being dismissive of those concerns, right? The next step will then be to think about how you can discuss the challenges and what that would require. So one other thing um, that I wanted to touch on that isn't necessarily a way of managing, with stre managing stress, but is important, especially in this climate, is to think about what we call moral injury. Now, this is a term that is usually associated with combat veterans or people who've gone through an extremely traumatic experience. And what moral injury is, is that it's the mental distress or trauma that occurs from having to do something that violates your ethical code, right? So what do I mean by this? If you strongly believe, right, that people should have the right to employment or they should be able to work or you should be able to provide as an employer certain resources to your employees and you're no longer able to do that, then this could lead to feelings like, oh my gosh, I'm so terrible. I can't believe I had to cut people's hours back. I can't believe I had to lay people off how could I do this? Like, if this was my ethics code and I violated this, like, what does this mean for me, right? And so this can result in intense feelings of shame or guilt. And if this is unresolved, can lead to mental health problems, right? And so not, the thing to remember and the thing that is reassuring is that not everyone who goes through really challenging situations where they have to make difficult decisions experiences moral injury, right? Some people from these experiences may experience growth become more resilient and also improve their outlook. And so what makes this difference? So being able to forgive yourself, recognizing that you're operating under circumstances that are not ideal, right? And not allowing the situation to define who you are, right? But being able to seek support, even though this could be difficult, especially when you're dealing with a lot of shame and guilt, these are things that can be helpful and can contribute to your growth overall. And so to wrap up, um, what I have here is just a practice slide, and this will be available on handouts that I will give to Lauren to send out to others. But again, to kind of bring everything together, when we're dealing with a challenging situation, right? We're dealing with a problem, something that's caused you to worry or to feel stressed, it's important to really think about, is this something that I can change? Right, remembering that there may be aspects to the situation that can be changed and others that can't be changed. And figuring out what are those pieces that I can address? And if yes, how do you actually address that problem? Like what does that look like, right? Who's involved, what's involved, where is this gonna happen? When is this gonna happen and how is this gonna happen? All right. And so again, remember that there's no blueprint for how to respond during a widespread illness. Um, especially one that's affecting many aspects of our lives, right? But to remember that there are ways to cope, right? When we think about coping strategies, it's important for us to focus on things that are actually going to help us and things that aren't going to add to our stress. If your coping strategy is something that you don't enjoy doing or that increases your worries, then that's not an effective strategy, all right? Um, and remember that it's important for you to take care of yourself, so that you can make the best decisions for yourself, for your company, for your families, for your loved ones, all right? So recognizing what is in, in control, recognizing your limits, and recognizing what you can do will all be very important in terms of how to effectively manage things as we go forward. And so here I have a list of resources that could be helpful in terms of if you feel like you've tried some of these techniques before and you're not able to effectively manage what you've been experiencing or your stress is just too much, you know, you're experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depression, then there are resources available, including those um, that are available virtually. So not promoting any one of these in particular, but just giving you a list of options um, and things that you can turn to. All right, so I will stop there because I want to leave enough time to address people's questions. Thank you so much, Marissa. That was great. We have a few thank yous coming through. Um, other questions are, people are interested in understanding if they can get copies of your slides. 
will those be available to um, circulate? Yep, I will have handouts that kind of summarizes everything um, and we'll be able to send those out. Great. And a similar vein, somebody's wondering, they said that Tuesday is actually World Health Day and they wanted to know if they'd be able to share the presentation with their community. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'll share that with them. Um, and people are asking about the recording. Yes, so we are recording all of the webinars from this week and um, I will send out an email with the link where we're posting all of those. So they're on our general emergency response program website under resources, but I'll make sure to send that message out as well. Um, if you have any questions, make sure to click on the Q&A box and type them in there and we're happy to address questions. I have a thank you coming through. <laughs> We have a couple of minutes in case people are typing questions. One thing I found, Marissa, is some of the stuff it's, you know, you're, when you're thinking of applying it to your own life and your own situation, it really takes some practice to think about, you know, how you would take these pieces of advice and make them specific to you. So encourage them. Yeah, I, excellent reminder, Lauren. Yes, right. And so these aren't things that I expect people to be able to do perfectly and right away. Right. And so, again, it's by starting small and focusing on what little thing can I do? Right. And recognizing that there's no need to add to the list of things you need to be perfect at right now. This is not the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really hone in on, you know, what's simple change. Right. I saw someone mentioning earlier, like drinking water. Right. Oh, that can reduce your stress levels um, or simply breathing. Right. Breathing for three seconds. Like, that's pretty easy. You're like, I can do that, right? And so again, this doesn't mean that you need to do something really extravagant um, in order or think about making this more difficult than you need to in terms of integrating some of these strategies into um, the presentation. I'm not into your, um, into your life right now. Someone, Any other questions? Someone said that it's a great reminder to build a plan while you're in good spirits to get you ready for panic mode. Yes. Thank you, Katie. That is very true. <laughs> All right. We know that we're in panic mode. It's kind of hard to get our thoughts organized. And so if we make these habits a part of our lifestyle, not just, you know, when things are bad or we're scrambling to do so, but by being intentional, recognizing that stress is normal, we're going to always deal with stress and having a plan in place that we can easily turn to, it makes it a lot more of a smoother transition when more difficult times arise. Great, thank ah, you. And Mary shared that we should focus on the bottom of the out breath, a moment of complete calm. Yes. All right, well, I don't see any more questions coming through, but if people do have questions about the webinar or the program, feel free to reach out to any of us generator staff who've been in touch with you. Um, another reminder again, that you can sign up for one-on-one um, -on -one meetings to talk about your business and we can connect you with the federal and state resources that are available to you. So please don't hesitate to sign up for one of those or to just reach out to us if uh, you'd like to set up one of those for a different day. Um, I'm going to thank you again, Marissa. This was a great presentation. Oh, maybe there are a couple. So somebody, um, oh, somebody's making oh, questions <laughs> about the Calm app um, for ongoing support. And someone else is asking about um, oh, I'm guessing this is related to, you know, the current uh, pandemic crisis. How do you talk to someone um, that's a hypochondriac to help them? That is, a, that's a whole nother presentation. <laughs> so I guess addressing some of those maybe yeah. hypothetical side of the concerns. That exactly, exactly, right? And so, Again, recognizing that one, they're gonna be limits to how much you're gonna help this person. You can provide support and resources um, in a way that would be beneficial to them. And another thing too with helping people is that we often impose what we think would be helpful onto them, right? And it can be very difficult when someone has very distinct views about what they find helpful versus what we find helpful. But as Lauren pointed out, it'll be really critical to you know, recognize that there's if you're focusing too much on hypotheticals, then that's gonna be counterproductive, right? And with someone who's a hypochondriac, being able to change that person and thinking that the goal for you helping them is gonna cause them to change, 
like that's an unrealistic expectation, right? Because this is something that they've been struggling with for a while. And so being flexible and creative in terms of thinking about, well, how do I actually address this um, to make sure that there's not just more stress that I'm going to take on, right? And realizing that when it comes to other people, that's where we tend to think we have more control than we actually do have. Great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, this is my contact information. I'll be sure to send out um, a worksheet that nicely summarizes um, all the points made on this slide in about six to seven pages. And yes, I'm happy to help in any way. So thank you again, Lauren and the Generator staff for providing me with the opportunity to share these tips. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.